Today we're going to be reading from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, who are talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. Here ends the reading of the scripture. This week is an important week. It marks the beginning of the season in the church year known as Lent. It starts this Wednesday. It's known to many as Ash Wednesday in many churches, even in this city. The palms from last year's Palm Sunday have been saved, and by now they've been burned to ashes. And those ashes will be what marks the forehead of many worshipers on Ash Wednesday as they remember the sacrifice of Jesus it's a time of mourning. It's a time of remembering. It's a time of self-examination. It's a sign of repentance and a turning around. And it's a remembering that because of the sacrifice of Jesus, all sins are forgiven. The season of Lent is often introduced by this passage that we read today, known as the Transfiguration. This passage of Scripture and this scene that we read about today was to be Jesus' last mountaintop experience. This was the last time he would go up on the mountain with his father, to get away to a lonely place with his father, except for the garden. But that was different. The garden would be a much different scenario than this time on top of the mountain. This time, not only is he going to be there with three disciples, but he's also going to be there with... Moses and Elijah. And we don't know exactly what happened in the conversation that they had, but what we do know is that after this experience on top of the mountain, Jesus goes back down the mountain and resolutely, one foot in front of the other, he makes his way to Jerusalem and the cross. So it's a good time for us to remember what transpired. Our text starts with a very interesting few words. Three words that sometimes uh, we miss, but three words that are very important because it's those three words upon which everything else pivots. The first three words of our text today, do you remember them? It was six days later. 
Now, sometimes we read past those so fast that we just kind of think of them more in terms of marking time, which they do. But they become very important in this text to give us a clue as far as what this text really is about. Six days later. So whatever happened six days earlier seems to be very, very important as Mark is writing this down and talking about this experience. What happened six days earlier that was so important for Mark to mention it this way? Well, we learn that I suppose six days earlier in Mark chapter 8, see it's hard to know how many days goes by from one chapter to the next, doesn't it? But apparently six days earlier in Mark chapter 8, we read about a discussion that Jesus had with his disciples about who do people say that I am? That was the hot topic of the day. Who do people say that I am? What's, being, what's the scuttlebutt going on around? What are you hearing? Who do people say that I am? And, and it stays there and it's kind of a good place for it to stay. And as long as it stays there with that question posed that way, we can all just take a step back and go, yeah, indeed. Who do people say that he is? Uh, the problem, though, is that right after that, Jesus looks them squarely in the eyes and he says, Okay, now, who do you say that I am? Oh, and that puts it in a whole different light, doesn't it? Because now it lands directly on our heart and in our mind. Because, you see, we're part of that group of disciples that I believe Jesus still asks the question of. Who is Jesus to you? Your answer to that question is absolutely crucial to your faith walk. If you have no answer to that question, you ought to take the time to think about it. Who is Jesus to you? Well, right after that conversation that he had with his disciples, uh, he told them exactly what was going to transpire. He told them that they were on their way to Jerusalem, that once they got to Jerusalem, he would be betrayed, he would be handed over, he would be rejected, he would be killed, and he would be dead, and the third day he would rise again. Uh, you couldn't have it more clear than that. He said exactly what was going to happen, and it still seemed that they didn't get that. They didn't get that. Even though it was as clear as Jesus could possibly make it, it seemed like the disciples just didn't quite yet make the connection. This couldn't happen, could it? This couldn't happen to somebody who... Peter just said, well, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. And if you are the Christ and you are the Messiah, well, surely those things could not happen. Because the Messiah and the Christ, in Peter's mind, was a military ruler who was going to kick the Romans out and return Israel back to the good old days. And it seems like six days later... Jesus was really concerned about the fact that they just still didn't get it. There still was some question about who are you, Jesus, in the disciples' minds. And so he decides not to take the whole group, but he decides to take just three of them. 
the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, who are sometimes known as Jesus' inner circle, his best friends, his closest people. He somehow seems to know that these three have to get it. They have to get who he is. And so he decides to take him up a mountain. I can see him, can't you? He decides one day to take them up the mountain. We think it's Mount uh, Hermon. That was over there by Caesarea Philippi, where they had just been. Mount Hermon sits at 9,000 feet above sea level, so it was no small task crawling up this mountain. To crawl up this mountain, you needed fortitude. You were going to be sore. You were going to be out of breath. You were going to be struggling. You were, you kind of needed each other to help you up the mountain. It was no small task crawling up a 9,000 foot high mountain. That's the first thing that's really interesting. It's not that Jesus just snapped his fingers and all of a sudden they were here and then they were up there. No, they had to work at crawling up the mountain. They had to work at getting to their mountain top. And that is true for all of us sometimes. Mountain tops just don't come magically, they sometimes come after a great deal of struggle. When all of a sudden we find ourselves on our mountaintop and Jesus is there and we feel close. I can see him up there on top of that mountain and the beautiful vistas that were right in front of them. I can see them. I bet they could see the Mediterranean Sea. I bet they could look on all sides of that mountain and see the most beautiful vistas. But the beauty that they were looking at would not compare with what they were about to see. And I can imagine Peter, James, and John going, Oh, look at that! Look at that! Look at that! When all of a sudden somebody says, Whoa, look at that! And they catch Jesus out of the corner of their eye. And something magical almost is happening Something that is so out of the ordinary. Jesus has become dazzling white. Not just his skin, but even his clothes. Our text says, As white such as no one on earth could bleach them. How white it was. Dazzling. Almost hard to look at. They were given the opportunity to see Jesus' body glorified. In other words, what Jesus was going to look like after the, his death and resurrection and ascension, God gave them a glimpse of Jesus' glorified body. Now, if there was any question in their minds about who Jesus is, now they had a reference, something that they had seen. God gave them the chance to see something that we all can only dream about seeing and the hope of seeing it one day when we stand with Jesus face to face in eternity. Won't that be an amazing sight? Just think about it. And you may recall kind of a similar thing about this glorified body. Remember Moses in the Old Testament when he had been up on the mountain all of those days talking with God and getting the law and he came back down the mountain and his face was glowing with the glory of God. He had just picked up God's glory. He was full of God's glory. It was bursting out from his face so brightly that the people told him, you got to cover that up. We can't, we can't look at that. 
you're too bright, Moses. And so he covered up the glory with a veil. Remember that story from the Old Testament? In the same way, God was reflected on Moses' face. Now God is reflected off of Jesus, where not only just his face, but even his very clothes become dazzling bright. Wow. God gave the disciples clear visual evidence of who Jesus is, so that one day they could answer that question. The second thing that we hear on top of that mountain is that it says before them and appearing to them. Mark seems to be making a point here that this divine revelation was designed exactly for the three disciples, not for Jesus. Jesus knew who his father was. But before them, appearing to them, these three disciples needed to get it. And what they saw was not just Jesus glorified, but the next thing they saw was Moses and Elijah. Now, how they knew it was Moses and Elijah, nobody quite knows. I mean, how would you know who they are? But somehow, God gave them knowledge to know that who, those two people who appeared with Jesus talking to him were Moses and Elijah. And of course, there are many theologians who say that that represented the law and the prophets. Moses prefigured Jesus as a type of Messiah. At one point, a savior who came and saved God's people out of bondage. And of course, Elijah would represent the prophets who talked about the time when, when the Messiah would come and when salvation would come. Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus and wouldn't it have been interesting if Peter would have been quiet enough, long enough to really get close and listen to the conversation. Aren't you curious? What is it they were all talking about? What was it? What was the message Moses and Elijah had for Jesus the Son of God. We don't know what they were saying, but what we do know that during their conversation, apparently Peter, out of fear and terror, couldn't help himself anymore, and he had to mess up the whole thing by talking. <laughs> I love that about Peter. It's like, you know, uh, talk first and think later. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Can I relate to that? He began to speak. And at that point, God couldn't take it any longer. And he had to talk to him. And he basically said to Peter, Would you be quiet? Sit down and be quiet. Anybody ever felt like saying that before? Like even to certain pastors? Yeah, it's true. We deserve it. God interrupted Peter's ramblings with the words that answered the question, Who is Jesus? Now not only were they going to see with their eyes who Jesus is, but they were going to hear with their ears who Jesus is. And the voice came and it said, This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. And when he says that, Moses and Elijah disappeared completely. 
and Jesus alone remained, it perhaps symbolized that the time of the law and the prophets had come to their end, and now it was time for them to pass away, because Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Moses and Elijah also represented the old covenant, and the old covenant was soon to pass away. Remember during communion when we say these words, when we pass around the cup, Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for many. You see, the old covenant was quickly coming to an end. And when Jesus shed his blood on the cross, there was going to be a new covenant, a new way of life with new possibilities. The text said that the voice came from a cloud. That's the Old Testament too. God was in the cloud. We hear it in uh, Exodus 16 verse 10. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, listen, they looked toward the wilderness And the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. They looked toward the wilderness. And the voice came from the cloud. And you know, when you and I stand on our mountaintops, when we are with and close to Jesus, when we face the broad vistas of our own wildernesses, When we stand hand in hand with Jesus, well, just knowing that Jesus is there and has a plan for our lives and has a new covenant to give us and has new lives to give us, well, it's like we can take a breath and we can gather our strength to head back down the mountain. Because, you know, when the cloud comes over those disciples up there on top of that mountain, when clouds come over, there's shadows, aren't there? And we all here, sitting here today, know something about having to walk through shadows, don't we? There's something about shadows that we are all very familiar with. We never, any of us, see things clearly this side of glory. We are left with whys. We are left with struggles. We are left with I don't knows. We are left sometimes with shadows. The psalmist himself said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We know what that's like too. We've walked with people through those shadows. But one thing we have come to know is that God meets us in the shadows. in incredible ways. And I'm sure that if we opened this up, there would be testimony after testimony how God has met you in the valley of the shadows. Hmm. The voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. You know, God had spoken something similar before. It was at Jesus' baptism three years earlier. Remember that? When Jesus was baptized and he came out of the water, there was a voice that said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But that time, that voice, that time, the voice from heaven was for Jesus. This time, it's for the disciples. This time, it's the disciples who needed to hear this voice. This time the voice was for those disciples on top of the mountain and I believe and would guess that it is the voice for all of the disciples of all time who would come after them. You and I who are disciples who sometimes still are asking the question, who are you Jesus and what do you have to do with my life? 
Who are you, Jesus, when I feel like you're a million miles away? Who are you, Jesus, to me right now today? Who are you, Jesus, with me and my friends at school and the peer pressure that I go through? Who are you in my circle of friends? Who are you in my job? Who are you in my health issues, in my sicknesses, in my sorrows, in my depression? Who are you, Jesus, and what have you to do with me in my life. I believe we still ask the question and we still need to hear the answer on top of the mountain. And the answer still today is, this is my son. Listen. Listen. We are to wake up. We are to be quiet and listen. Gosh, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? Oh, except that we are so concerned with getting heard. We are so concerned about getting our way. We are so concerned trying to keep things on course the way we've always done things (laughs) that we forget to sit down and be quiet long enough to have God speak to us in new and relevant ways, both in our personal lives and in the lives of a church. What is it that God wants you to do? Who is it that God wants you to be? Just the same old person you were yesterday and the day before that and ten years? No. God has a new person. God is continually in the process of making you new. And now that God had their attention on top of their mountain, there wasn't anything else that they could say. And as his words thundered off into the vistas and the valleys... All they could do was fix their eyes on Jesus and look at him and see nothing else. Oh, you know the song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Did you see that in the passage? It said they looked and they saw only Jesus When we stop and look and finally see only Jesus, all of our goodness, all of our acts of love and charity, all of our heroism, all of our patriotism, all of our strongly and sometimes strangely held views, all of it means absolutely nothing compared only to Jesus Christ. And his love. That's what matters more than anything else. On this Transfiguration Sunday, before Ash Wednesday and the beginning of Lent, we would do well to remember that we as worshipers have the responsibility of glorifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We do that when we lift him up, when we give him our thanks and our praise. And during this season of Lent, I pray that we might find the time to ask ourselves on a daily basis, Jesus, who are you to me? And to grapple with the question that others may ask. Who is Jesus? May this time be the time 
when we think about that daily. Who is Jesus to you? And what does it mean? We will glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords because he is God's beloved Son, the great I Am.